My name is Victor Furman. Some call me The Voice. I've always been fascinated with human nature, spirituality, science, and the crossroads at which they meet. Join me now and we will explore these topics and so much more with fascinating guests, authors, and experts who will guide us to Destination Unlimited. Are psychic gifts passed down through our DNA? Does growing up in a metaphysical family engender and encourage the development of these gifts? My guest this week on Destination Unlimited, psychic and medium Joan Cara, grew up in a metaphysical family. Her father had an occult library, and her mother and aunt were highly intuitive, so psychic phenomenon was natural and not supernatural. Joan gives guidance on matters of the heart and business and can help you overcome blocks. She's also a gifted medium and can connect with those who have passed. Joan's spiritual counseling is recognized in seven books, including the first edition of the Top 100 Psychics in America, Psychic New York, and The Rational Psychic. She's been interviewed in WAG Magazine, The Wall Street Journal, and The Daily News, in which she predicted the flooding of New York City several months before Hurricane Sandy. She's a contributing author for the series Harmony and Chakras, Volumes 1 and 2. She's taught at the Lilydale Assembly, the Edgar Casey Center, Wainwright House, as well as other venues in the United States. Her website is psychicjoancara.net, and she joins me this week to share her amazing story. Please join me in welcoming to Destination Unlimited, psychic medium Joan Cara. Welcome, Joan. Thank you so much, Victor. Joan, we had the pleasure of meeting about 25 years ago at Bob Cecilio's Queens Psychic Club. Please share with our listeners your early path and what it was like to grow up in a metaphysical family. Wow. Okay. Um, you know, I was living in Manhattan and I moved to Queens and a woman that I met like twice, I she said, do you know about the Queen Psychic Club? And I said, no. And then she told me about it. And I don't drive. So it was a, a bus around the corner that just brought me there. The Queen Psychic Club was pretty amazing what Bob did. He had a different psychic lecture every month. And um, he had psychic fairs. And you could put your flyer out. And if it weren't there, your flyer was still out. And he did a public access show. This is before the internet. Yes. And his story is amazing because he be, he started a club because he had a dream. His son died and he contacted a medium and he wound up on this path. And the dream told him that he was going to start a psychic club, not something he ever expected to do. And that was a, a good community of support. We'd all help each other with, oh, we have a gig here. We need another psychic and things like that. I did three lectures with Bob, and I, he really uh, put me on a path. He was so encourager, encouraging, which he was to everybody, and pretty amazing. And Bob also wrote two books, and he's going to celebrate his 90th birthday. And one of my friends said, because I did the reunion uh, before COVID with Bob for his birthday, and my friend said, Joan, you should start planning for a reunion for Bob's 90th birthday at a restaurant. So uh, you're the first one to be invited, Victor. And I was at the last one, and I'm grateful right, that right, you right. guys organized yeah. it. So, so, yeah. so the 90th, he's still going strong. And uh, growing up in a metaphysical home, what's interesting is, so for me, I always say, it's not supernatural, it's natural. And I think a lot of people have this where their grandmother would talk about, you know, I had a dream of some relative who passed, and they would try to look at what the meaning was. So, um, yeah, my family was very psychic. And my aunt would come and she would read 
cards from the nine to the ace. And, and she said she was taught by some woman. Um, and she was phenomenal. She would also read the coffee grinds. Now, we were too young to drink coffee, but then eventually we could. We'd save the cups to, for Aunt Joe to read. And she would just read for family and friends. It wasn't something you promoted in those days. There were no party jobs to do. No one was on TV. So that was something like fun. And, you know, she had some amazing things. There's one that my older cousin, he, he would call himself my uncle because he was much older he, and that was his mother. So he would say when he had his first car, they loved their red car it was in front of their apartment and they just got it. And my aunt said, but I see a new blue car in front of your apartment. That's yours. And they said, you know, that doesn't make sense. We love this car. Sure enough, like within a, two weeks or so, the car got stolen and they had to get a new car. Uh, hopefully insurance helped, which was blue. So you couldn't argue with Aunt Joe. You just couldn't. And my mom, she was the dream interpreter. She always had this big, thick dream book that was really worn out. And people, her family would call her Aunt, Ma, uh, Aunt, Aunt Rose. We had this dream. And she also had, this is not a fun thing to have, she had the ability to dream of when somebody was going to die. You go to the funeral twice. It's very hard to have that talent because you can't do anything about it. You can't save the person. And sometimes it's people that you don't expect. One dream my mom had, which is just amazing, my Dad's foreman, we were in the garment industry. My dad had the coat factory. So his foreman was his nephew. And he just moved to a new home. And he was, a baby was on the way. And my parents were going to visit the home and the expected mom. And my mom has a stream. This, and this is a young man. He's not 60 years old. He's like maybe late 30s, 40 at the most, probably late 30s. Um and she tour, She has a tour of the home in the dream. She did not see the home yet. And she hears this voice saying, um, his name was Nikki. And she, the voice said, here's the home, the kitchen, the living room, the baby's coming, but Nikki will never see his home. So sure enough, maybe within, I don't know, they just moved. My dad gets a phone call at 3 a.m. Uh, Nikki went to the house with something minor. And they called to say, he just died from a blood clot that hit him. And then, you know, it's devastating. And then my parents go to see now this very young widow with a baby on the way. And my mom said the house was exactly like the dream. She was, you know, it was exact. And my dad loved, my dad was a big bookworm. So he built a big library and of everything. My sister always said we never had to go to the library to do a book report. We just picked a book from my dad's <laughs> big library. And he had a lot of occult things. He studied Rosicrucian, Rosicrucianism. And I I loved, we had a, prescri- a subscription to Fate Magazine. Mm-hmm. And, and readers would write in about the story. And many of them were the same. Like I woke up in the middle of the night and this relative came and I, to saying goodbye, and then they we found out that they died, or um, I felt the you know uncanny things that we talk about now openly. But Fate Magazine was the one to do it, and so we had a lot of books on the subject, and it was just uh, you know I remember it's I think I was sixteen, and I I did a, we could write a we could write a report on anything we wanted, and I wrote it on astrology. <laughs> And they even, I even had a, a, my parent, my dad even encouraged me. Oh, you're interested in Shirley Joan. I, a, a class, it was from a, a, it was a mail order class from a guy in England uh, for astrology. Now, this was an advanced astrology. And I was doing it, but being an Aries, I didn't finish. And they were like disappointed, like, wait, we spent money on this and you didn't finish. The class, you know, it was an extra class, more math to do. Well, I was good in math, so that was okay. 
But I was never expecting to do this as a path. I mean, I had, you know, as a, I was someone who was extremely silent growing up, very studious, very withdrawn, the class blusher. So when the kids were talking, I was reading the book and I was interested in, oh, I, I'll be a doctor. And then my sister, she's six years older, she was going to college and she was educational major and she minded in psychology and I read all her psychology books seventh grade eighth grade ninth grade my favorite book she had was abnormal psychology I so I was just devouring these books but then I was part of you know the Beatles came I was a good writer so I was writing poems and to me they were little songs and I wanted to pursue more of a creative path because being this quiet student I was in the advanced classes and art wasn't like considered intellectual, but I did it in the summer. And I said, well, it is intellectual. So I, w- I was trying to pursue things like that. Basically, my day jobs didn't work. I, I, I switched from NYU to Goddard College, which was an experimental school, no grades. We designed your own curriculum. I fell in love with the radio station. It was like the bastard child. And I me and some of the students, we really resurrected it. And it became actually a big part of the school. That was my first time I was really with my peer group and socializing. And and I was studying writing. Uh, I worked in public radio for a year in Vermont. After that, I came back and things were not easy. My mother was dying of cancer. I was in a toxic relationship which I didn't understand I felt hypnotized it, it was just bad and then basically I I actually because things were so negative in my life and emotionally painful I just did a surrender prayer I didn't understand why my life was falling apart and that's when I saw this beam of light this loving light of you know I wanted to be forgiven I was not on the right path I never did drugs so it was nothing like that I felt you can never describe it in words because there are no words in the human model. <laughs> but this oneness of uh, the light, we're all one. Even a little spider, remember, that was a vision. A little spider is important and it has a path and I'm connected to the little spider. And it was this all forgiving energy. And then I had a nervous breakdown. And I had a psychotic break and I had flashbacks. So I had memories, you know, of a sexual abuse encounter when I was young outside the home. And that's always heavy. And I worked with the doctors and then I I went back to work, which was a healing process. And I, I basically, besides working with doctors, I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress and depression I had since the third grade that I always had. People don't believe me, but I struggled with it. and um, I'm better now. Besides working with doctors, I had the spiritual path to heal myself because it seemed like that was an aspect. And Yale University is doing a study. They reached out to psychics that a lot of psychics come from trauma. So this is how I say it. You either, when you have trauma, and we all, so many people have trauma, you either self-medicate and self-destruct or self-heal and heal others. And that's a choice. Hopefully, you'll do the latter if you can. So I was just, I took a day job in the city, temp job that lasted three and a half years, They taught me the bookkeeping. No one wanted to do the numbers. I skipped a grade in math. I love, I could do math easily. So um, I I was on that path. And then I just assumed, and maybe my ego that, oh, I'm a writer. I'm writing songs. I could sell it and I'll be supporting, I'll support myself in my writing. But that didn't happen. So I got bounced around through a lot of jobs. And I didn't have the concentration. Luckily, that job was a very calm place. Other jobs weren't. And I got fired a lot. It was not easy. It was so difficult. And then I was just reading cards from my friends the way my aunt did. And I was in 
were working for a friend. She had two psychics that she sent to Japan. And my coworker was very young. He was still in graduate school at NYU. He wanted a reading. He said, I'll give you a pass to the gym because he worked there. And he said, Joan, you should do this. I said, are you out of your mind? Because I, I had two jo- two part-time jobs and I can only collect an appointment for one. And he paid me. I said, you don't have to me. This is, he said, no, you're good. So he said, find a restaurant. So he kept pushing me. So then I found a restaurant that said Astrology Cafe that they had in the back. And that was from the first vegetarian restaurant in New York. New York. And she was an astrologer and uh, Virginia, um, she wrote, she now writes books and she had different psychics. I was a substitute in the beginning because they didn't, you know, it was all filled. And then I was, uh, I had my own day and then I had two days. And then, oh, I've got her name. Um, she was a radio broadcaster. She came in. I didn't, she didn't want to say her name. And then one of my coworkers, the waiter said, she just talked about, she had a reading from you here. So and then in walks in, and now I'm not expecting to do this work. I, I'm like, all right, I'm making some cash, and they're feeding me well. So uh, why not do it? And I feel as a psychic, and I and someone even told me, you get a like a hormone of peace and happiness, and you feel very healed because you you're helping people, and people have problems just as difficult as yours, if not more. So it puts me in that peaceful mode. And then um, and walks in a party agent and she hires me. And I never I never heard of such a psychic going to parties. And it was for a promotion for Self Magazine. I had to work one, for one hour every day to go to these different publications and read the staff. So I met someone in the bathroom because we were the only ones who read the receptionist because we knew she couldn't get in. And we were the ones who got in Wall- the Wall Street Journal. They interviewed us. <laughs> and I couldn't believe I made $700 for working one hour a day for seven days. It was crazy. It said, I was jumping up and down screaming when I saw the check. And then everybody guides you with this. And and how I got in the first two books, Top 100 Psychics of America, Psychic New York, I was studying Louise Hay. Everyone was telling me, read the Louise Hay book. I said, yeah, yeah, I read it. Then one woman looked at me a psychic and said, read it again. You're too negative. I reread the book three pages, you know, slowly. I did every single thing that she said to do. I'd stare at the wall. I changed my negative thoughts. I was in a lot of emotional pain. What was me? You know, everything was a nightmare. So I and I had physical pain that nobody could figure out for decades. So I started to work with the book and I knew two friends who did PR and they even said, oh, I'll get you some PR. But with the discount, I couldn't afford it. I was living on pennies. And I uh, I did what Louise had, hey, said. So I lit a candle and you don't need to light a candle and said steady, you know, steady flow clients. I now have free PR. I have free PR. A lady calls me and we, you know, I had... I, oh, I have to put, I just put in a $25 ad in Free Spirit. That was a New Age magazine back then. And this lady calls me and wants to interview me for this book about psychics. I said, all right. And then this is like days after I said that med- that affirmation. And then someone else calls me for the book. I said, yeah, you called me last week. She said, no, I didn't. And when I said about the book, she said, that's not my book. I'm Psychic New York. I was like, what? Two books? I had to read for the authors and they put me in the books and I was only a year out, but I did the positive energy of steady flow of clients and free publicity. And in those days, books were king. It wasn't the internet. I got a lot of clients from it. Psychic New York, she put that book in every tourist place that sells, you know, souvenirs. And if you came to New York, that book was there. And, Top 100 psychics. That was amazing. And there were famous psychics she didn't put because if you did weren't nice to her, she said, oh, well, that person was so nasty. They're not getting in the book. So that was that. And then 
think snowboarded, you do, um, you start to do the psychic fairs. Bob had them. I, you do, you, you go to these expos and it was just amazing. It was, it was still hard. And then you hook up with agents, which you don't expect. They find you and you're doing parties and you're like, um, you look when I first started parties. Oh my God. I, I was with clowns. I was with stilt walkers. I was with magicians. I was like at 40 years old, I ran away to the circus. And what was interesting was the party work. And I still say it for today. It balances a lot of the serious, painful stories. You have to work with people in crisis and in pain. So I like that balance because the party's lighter readings, more fun. I, I have, you know, I'm witty during that time. So that's what, for me, they're there for. And, you know, just things were like that. And I was, it, now that works not steady, but but it brought me. And then I, and I kept going to Connecticut, which is funny. I was a New Yorker and I, what do I know about Connecticut? <laughs> <laughs> and I did some corporations in Westchester, Connecticut, and I'm doing these mansions in the back country of Connecticut. And because I was a real psychic, the party agent would get requests from me. So I kept coming up and I would, you know, if the party, I get the Metro North and I get to New York at one o'clock in the morning, I would take a cab to Queens. It was kind of late. And then I wanted to move, and I said, I did a vision board. I said, I can move to, Cal oh, I, somehow I got to California in Ojai, California, which is a very metaphysical place with Christian Amerti followers and every kind of thing like that. And that was like, I was a queen there. I I, I was like, I don't even know how I, I found it because I studied the New Age magazines. Um, and I said, or everyone's lecturing there. And I was in LA and I said, I don't even know how I'm going to get there, but I'll get there. So magical town for me so i said to myself i can move to ohio but i didn't want to move there because i would have to be friends with my clients and buy buy furniture and a tv and then it it's very hot there in the summer and then it reminded me of vermont which i lived in for a couple of years for school and i worked in um vermont public radio i said well i did the small town it's too much for me. I, I love mountains. I'm a mountain girl. And then I said, oh, what about Long Beach? That's nice. Except there's only the Long Island Railroad to get to New York City. And I said, well, if I miss that train, I'm never getting to New York City on time. And then I have to go up to Connecticut. So I did a vision board with a lot of nature, just beautiful nature. And two years later, uh, this is before all the internet. That's where you got apartments. It was, I look at it, the New York Times and they said it was a apartment that was the same rent as a nice apartment in Queens. And it was like, with a pond and a pool. I said, I gotta check this out. It's in Greenwich. I'm always going up there. Now I know nothing about this area and except that when I did the parties and I was at night, so I never saw there was a town or anything. And I didn't know anything about Westchester. I, I called Westchester upstate and they were all laughing when I said, well, look, I'm from Long Island. This is upstate to us. So I come, you're never going to believe this story. I come and they show me this beautiful, big studio, nothing like a studio in New York, really big with a patio, a garden overlooking the pond, the million dollar view. And then they say, well, the price in the New York Times is wrong. The rent is less. <laughs> Wow. Wow. In Greenwich, uh, Connecticut. The, yeah, I wasn't ready yet. So they gave me two weeks off. And, I, and then my neighbor comes out and she finds out I'm a psychic. She runs back into her apartment and she comes out with the James Van Prague book. And she said, I was at the beach. I love the beach. Nothing makes me leave the beach. But I heard this voice in my head. Go home. Go home. Now. I didn't want to go home. She and she's reading the James Van Prague book on the beach. This is nuts, right? <laughs> and she's um, she's young and she's single and she's she starts selling me the apartment. 
this is a young place. There's a beach, which I didn't know. And and, and then I found out there's a bus on the corner because I don't drive and I'm not going to drive. And she was so ecstatic. And when I moved in with my family, helped me move the furniture. We hear this big scream from the neighbor going, that's the person I was praying for to move in. <laughs> and I found out the neighbor before was, was nuts. So, uh, it was like, wow. And we were like sister friends in and out of each other's apartment. If I needed something, she had it. If she needed something, I had it. So that and she was a lot of fun. Yeah. And that's how Joan Cara got to Greenwich, Connecticut. My guest I, is psychic yeah. medium Joan Cara. Joan, please share with our listeners where they can find out more about you and your offerings. All right. A uh, much needed update for my website, which is coming. Um, psychic. Joan Cara, C A R R A dot N E T net. Psychic Joan Cara dot net. Email is the best. Psychic Joan at Yahoo. Psychic Joan at Yahoo. If you call because of the robo calls, I have to keep the ring off, but make sure you leave a message 203 531 6387. And we'll be back with more of Joan after these words on the Ohm Times Radio Network. The cutting edge of conscious radio. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. Ohm Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Back on Destination Unlimited, my dear friend, psychic medium Joan Cara is my guest this week. Joan, when you do mediumistic work for a client, what is your process and how do you connect with the departed loved ones? That's a good question. For me, sometimes before the session, I'll just give like an invitation out. Uh, a lot of times I forget because now it's so automatic. I do get a symbol of a hand with a yellow rose, which means welcome from the other side. That's my symbol. If it's a group, I do start a little meditation with breathing, we lift our hands. And on the third one, I say, shake your root chakra because we're going to be sitting for a while. And to calm people down, I say, this is protection. We're not going to get any um, wild, crazy spirits unless they're your relatives. <laughs> and then at the end, I do the same thing. And we, I thank the spirits for coming. Um, a lot of times, just a one-on-one, -on -one, I'll just go right into it and... I never expected to do this because my aunt didn't do it. And I grew up seeing the Tony Curtis, Harry Houdini film. So I didn't even know it was possible. And this is before you had all these mediums on TV. When I started and all the psychics I knew 30 years ago weren't doing mediumship. So I got guided by, I was working at a restaurant and the waitress wanted a reading. And she said, do you ever get names? I said, no. She said, try. I said, all right, as for Steve. And then she said, give me the message. That. And then I talked about love. And she said, that means a lot to me because Steve is in a coma dying. And I was upset. I, I'm starting to cry. I never did such a thing. And then a few months later, she I bumped into her and she said that was her son. And she couldn't even tell me because it was uh, I was so upset. But that freed me to give names. And some of the names were oddball names, you know, and I would give a message and people would say that's someone who passed. And I was shocked. So I, I didn't have anyone guiding me. Now everybody's going to all these places to study mediumship. I didn't study it. I was guided. So um, and sometimes I'm going to be honest. I have a friend, excellent medium. And then she went, to, I'm not going to name the places, but she went someplace and they said, well, you're just really a psychic, not a medium. You should take this class with me. And it's like over a thousand dollars. But she's doing it for 20 years. Why does she have to learn it their way? And when I was in, when I moved to Connecticut, I, 
Connecticut, I found there was a spiritualist church. I talked to them. I said, if you ever need a medium, she said, actually, we do. Because the ministers who were these legends, they were in their 90s or something. They, they retired and then passed. Um, or we have been visiting ministers who aren't psychic. So we'll tap it. We'll use you. So I was there quite often and do the readings. And then they trained their own mediums and, and got more. And then I kind of got phased out. But that's all right. Let other people have a chance. Do you, do you and, get your messages through through uh, clairaudience or clairvoyance or a combination? Oh, everything. Okay. Oh, everything. Even body movements. And um, <laughs> all right. I I hear a voice. Sometimes it could be like a gruff voice or something. I feel sensations on my body. They don't hurt uh, for an illness or an ailment or operations. I feel that. Um, I see pictures and the food. <laughs> my time. I always say psychics get fat between the party work and eating all the food of the dead people. I had one time is I told, I said this is a spaghetti holic, and the person said, "Yeah, he eats spaghetti for breakfast." So, um, and you get nicknames, and um, it's very interesting. And people, one of the things that I want to stress is don't feel guilty you did everything you could for your loved one and if you had an argument with your mother and she unexpectedly died you had that same argument for 50 years and you know what she still loves you let them feel oh she hates me and blah blah and you don't have to keep all their furniture they could care less um and oh you weren't there when they took their last breath that's all right that's all right so no guilt, too much guilt, and people well, beat themselves up over this. Well, one of the things that I do, I, as an interfaith minister, I've conducted many funerals. And one of the mm. things that I hear from time to time is people will say, I wish I had told them I love them. I wish I had asked for mm. forgiveness. I wish I had offered forgiveness to situations where their loved ones had passed away and they didn't have a chance to have that final conversation. What do you say to them? You can still do it. They hear you. And they know what's going on. You know, I had a, a client say, does my father know I adopted two children? And the answer was skating. And she said, oh, my God, yesterday I brought them ice skating. I said, your father was there. So they know what's going on. And just um, um, talk to them as though I'm just going to talk to you and say, I always wanted to say this. And it was hard. Forgiveness is a journey. It's not the easiest thing in the world. Intellectually, it is. But in your heart and soul level, it's, it's a process. So you're allowed. Is there, is, there um, anything, is there anything during a session that you will not share with a client? I only did that once. I only did that once. I, you know, a lot of people say you're going to say anything bad. I said, I, I, I may, I'm going to call it stress and I'm going to give you coping me mechanisms for your stress. You know, if you're losing a job, I, I wouldn't say you're losing. I said, oh, you have new beginnings and new opportunities. So you, it's how you phrase it. I don't, I never, if people ask me when so and so going to die, I say, listen, you'll be first to know I won't go there. I never want to go there. The only thing I didn't, share i just couldn't i there was a lovely client a gay guy adopted forced a child and he no he didn't adopt he wanted to he had the i don't know what's called he was like sponsoring this child what he was gonna adopt and it was sudden some old like grandfather or relative popped up not the parents wanted the kid back and he 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 was devastated he said no i have i, I really love this child and I did see that the child was going to leave, but I couldn't say it. He was so heartbroken as it was. I just couldn't say it. He then adopted another child, but I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. And some things aren't revealed to us. And that's really important. We're not God. We don't know everything. I had one client. Oh, my God. She had to go for a biopsy for her breast. And I said, well, I don't see a cancer. And she came back to me a year later and she said, you know, it wasn't just you. Every psychic I went to said, I won't, I don't have breast cancer, but I did. And I had the operation. I, and she said, well, how come nobody knew? I said, it wasn't revealed to us. And I, that's all I could, 
I don't know. And I do encourage people to go to the doctors. I'm not one of those people who say, oh, Western medicine is no good. Oh, my God. They study, too. And that's what I say. They study, too. And you know what? There's nothing more wrong with uh, medicines. Yes, you could look at it. It's cool. complementary. Yes, know your vitamins. Know things you can do, but work with your doctor. You know, I'm not going to tell you. I don't know. I, I I'm strict that way. Other people, I'm not going to argue with people. You 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 do your journey, but there's nothing wrong with going to the doctor. Yes, sometimes they it could be over medicated and things, but just listen to both sides. That's how my, I would say. My spiritual teacher used to say, "Never instead of, always in addition to." So don't Ooh, eliminate I love one. That. Yeah, don't eliminate the one. You have all of these wonderful sources and resources. Use them all. Use them all. That's all. Well, I've got to write that one down. No. All right. I'm going to write that. Think that. You're going to email me that. That is a gem. A gem. Your work has been recognized in the top 100 psychics in America, Psychic New York, and other publications. Mm. What did it make you feel like to be honored in that way? Well, the first two was like, because I was just a year out. The first two, I was like ecstatic because how, you know, it was something I wasn't expecting to do. It was not my path. And I was, I was like, I wasn't a good office worker and I, cause I couldn't concentrate. I was recovering from PTS and it, it was something where I go, how could this even be? I, I, and then it was giving me things I wasn't giving myself like, and then I became my own boss with this, which was like, I still do it. And now with the internet, which, you know, is a curse and a blessing, I have to do more typing than I did at an office. <laughs> and yeah, it's terrible. And um, also because I was a bookkeeper and my accountant says, <laughs> out of all our clients, I'm the only one that does this very detailed ex Excel spreadsheet. And I know all the, all the breakdowns and stuff. And then I did my own PR I, I got in magazines and stuff I and um newspapers I called and and I got in I got in those and, um now it's a little more difficult for me cuz I'm from old school and I did well with the print ads and everything but I'm at a loss I tried some Instagram things I'm not obsessed with it and the print ads weren't working the way they used to so I'm at a loss and I'm just uh hire a kid. <laughs> Wait, what'd you say? Hire a kid. Hire uh, hire I, hire a student. I know, you have to, yeah. Rent a teenager. <laughs> yeah. Well, I hired someone. It was a lot of money and she was she was good, but it, it was just I said, I can't keep up I, it's too much for me. And mm -hmm. I and I saw how yeah, hire a kid is the the, the thing. Yeah. You were a contributing author for the series Harmony and mm -hmm. Chakras, Volumes 1 and 2. What did you share in those books? The first book, I did the first, no, I did the, the, the upper chakras. And I had this amazing story. My friend who's the editor and whose idea this book was, she, she had a, a whole bunch of healers writing it. I swear to God, she was there. And... I, I said to her, oh, Olivia, I, I really am not going to do the lower chakras because everyone's, everyone always says, you're, the healers say, you're too much in your head, your lower chakras are blah. So we're talking about that. And I get this phone call from this guy with an Indian accent. And he says, my name is Sun. And I was meditating on Mount Shasta. And I'm listening. And I have her listen to it. And he says, he starts talking to me about my root chakra is blocked. And he's talking about things I said, are you kidding me? Just writing about that. And we couldn't figure out. I said, how'd you get my name? You're in Mount Shasta. <laughs> what are you doing? And he said, oh, I just worked at the Deepak Chopra Center. And we couldn't figure this out. And he said, oh, oh when I teach in New York, I'm going to invite you. And we were like shocked. I said, how, why would this guy call me out of the blue? So, uh, and I think we put that in the book, but the other book, which was really, I think we did three or one, I don't even remember now. Um, we, 
I wrote, she wanted it about children. So I wrote about psychic children. And that was really an important issue. And I interviewed my younger cousins, third cousins. They're telling me their kids are having psychic um, uh, visions. And I looked it up and Eon's Institute of Noetic Sciences had a study that it's genetic. You know how people say, oh, music runs in the family or we're all doctors. Well, the psychic. So I was fascinated by that because... I, you know, all the young kids are very into it. And I, I promised them, you know, you know, you always say we're going to get together and if you never do. But I did promise them I'm going to I'm going to teach the kids and everything. But it was like a um, that is amazing, you know, um, because a, children are a, intuitive. Th- this is a question that's come up from time to time when I've interviewed other people with your gifts. What do you say to parents who have a child who's manifesting these gifts? Uh, When I was a kid and I would share what I was experiencing, I would be told not to talk to anyone, that it was my imagination to shut up, basically. What do you say to kids today who are manifesting, the parents of kids who are manifesting these things? To listen. And one of the things Olivia, as the editor and publisher said, she put in the sentence, don't shut down your child because what if this, that means even if something's happening at school or being bullied or whatever, they know not to tell you because you already reinforced that. So listen to the children and get some information because sometimes they have beautiful messages for you. Um, so you can gently guide them with, um, Encouragement. You know, maybe encouragement. Um, but maybe you could even say, well, write everything down and let's look at that. You know, there, there's amazing stories of even American children who had past life experiences yes. and then they proved it. You know, they have a few cases like that. So I would say listen and be gentle. Um, that's important. Listen. The, the L word, listen, I think is so important. My guest, psychic medium Joan Cara, will be back with more after these words on the OM Times Radio Network. Humanity Healing International is a small nonprofit with a big dream. Since 2007, HHI has been working tirelessly to bring help to communities with little or no hope. Our projects are not broad mandates, nor are they overnight solutions but they bring the reassurance that no one is alone and that someone cares. To learn more, please visit HumanityHealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, host of Om Times Magazine's flagship radio show, What is Going Om? My passion is sifting through information, research, and innovations from new thought teachers, speakers, and researchers, pushing back the boundaries of what we know about life, energy, metaphysics, and the universe. I love shifting perceptions about who we are, why we're here, and how quickly impossible becomes normal when we open our minds, expand our awareness, and accept that the only limits that exist are those we place upon ourselves. So if you're the kind of forward-thinking, eager investigator of what lies beyond the current reality that most perceive, why not make a date to come play with me in the field of possibilities at 4 p.m. Pacific Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Time every Thursday, and together we can discover what's really going on. Back on Destination Unlimited, my guest this week, my dear friend, psychic medium Joan Cara. Joan, you've taught at the Edgar Cayce Center, the Wainwright House, Lilydale Assembly, and other venues in the United States. What were those experiences like, and how did it feel to teach others to embrace their gifts? You know, it's funny. Um, I never expected to be a teacher, but I'm a numerologist, so I'm born on a 25. Two plus five is seven. It's the lifelong student and teacher. And, and it is the most psychic number. So it did come natural. And my older sister is a teacher. Uh, so it was natural. And because I went to an experimental college with very small classes, six people, independent studies, 12 people, I enjoyed that small way of having a group. It was exciting because 
the creative part was how to develop a class. And because I had many different subjects, I could do a series on psychic development. It, it was very exciting. I loved it. I'm not teaching the way I used to. It's a, it's a now it's such a different time. It's before COVID, I called up a lot of places and I said, what's happening? We're not getting the numbers we used to get because before COVID, they started these video classes and you used to have, you know, 25 people show up and then all of a sudden you're lucky if you get six. So it was getting too small and you couldn't guarantee, you know, so that was very difficult. But the endurance, so it was just, a, you know, I don't know, it's difficult. What I liked was the discipline of besides teaching and seeing the students grow, it was working on the proposal because you have to think as a planner. And and in some places like Lilydale, I had to propose a class and then they have to review it. And I'm very vetted. So I have to prove myself as a psychic to a lot of places I work at, at New Age tours, the, the teaching places and also um, spiritualist churches, you name it, the party agents. So they get a reading from me because I'm not off the wall. You know, like he was amazing. Some of the students took a whole bunch of classes and they were like amazed. I still have people telling me when you taught energy healing, um, the, the, the woman I worked on and she verified it. She had this this neck pain or shoulder pain, and when I after I did it, she never had it again. And I was like stunned. I was like not expecting that. I want to tell you one thing. I had a psychic development class, and one woman was very negative, and we, we exchanged crystals and said, "What from the person her vibration on this crystal? Have you know what do you see? I have nothing. I have nothing." So I said, "If you could." Give me the first initially, you, you know, you hear she said A, and I said second and third, A, B, C. Then I said, give me numbers, one, two, three. Then I said, give me a color. And she said, red. You see, I have absolutely nothing. And then the girl who she read, whose crystal it was, said, actually, you do. I just visited my sister in her new home. Her initials are A, B, C. The number on the house is one, two, three, and it's a red door. So if you believe you have nothing, you're not going to recognize that you have something, right? You've made some major predictions in media mm. and elsewhere that have come to pass. Please share these with us. Well, I have the best one is the flooding of New York City. I was at an integrative study group and they had a, um, they had a shaman from Greenland. This goes back 20 something years ago. And he talked about he's visiting all over the world, the Dalai Lama, the Pope, that Greenland is melting. And I told him about my visions about New York flooding. And he said, it's not if, it's when. And he said, you need to share your vision. So then I get a, um, I don't know if it was the millennium or something, a bunch of psychics write daily news. And of course, they want to know marriage and divorces of celebrities. And I would say, I'm not a celebrity. Pap I'm not a psychic paparazzi. <laughs> and I didn't want to do I said I have something more important to say I said New York City is going to flood there's water and uh, all this water in New York City six months later we had Hurricane Sandy and sure enough it was a major flood some of these when I have visions you know like you're half awake it's not like I'm walking around the street it shakes you up It you feel it to the core and you feel emotionally what it is and you are upset, you know, if it's something painful. I did Trump and Hillary's birthday numbers, and Trump had the numbers. And I also heard psychically that it, it, that it would be a woman who's not connected to her husband who would be the first female president. And obviously, Hillary was connected to her husband. I've been meditating on this crazy year now. Before I even say anything, I just want to say we've had the eclipse and we had the solar flares, and, uh, the sun, and even an earthquake in New York, which has happened before. So we have a lot of shaking up to do. There will be reforms in the government. Let's hope that there's reforms for the Supreme Court. 
age limits and a code of ethics. Connecticut, we have a very strict code of ethics. You can't accept a gift for more than $50 and they have age limits. And, um, and then in um, Connecticut, most states do their own for their own super state court. But it's time we look at that. We have too much of a diverse America to say now we're going to take away LGBTQ rights and now women's rights. So there's a lot going on. I still think it's almost like a wake up call. So I would say there's a lot going on in America. Yes, it's very like, you know, the South is different than the Northeast, which it always will be. Um, we need, uh, that's all I could say. I, I don't know how, um, you know, if, uh, but there's going to be some, this is going to be a roller coaster year. And I pray for the country not to have the violence of, uh, you know, of 2020. Yeah, January 6th, I was I was shaking for days. I couldn't sleep for days because I kept seeing that picture of them climbing on the building. Yeah. So, yeah, we have to heal the country mentally because we have great things here. I mean, America is great. We don't have to remake it to be great. But I think the greatness is needs to be compassion. Absolutely. No question about it. This, this is what we're, we're striving for. This is what people of, of insight and people of, of open hearts is compassion for everyone, whether we agree with them or not. We have to start seeing each other as sisters and brothers and move forward with compassion. What would you like our listeners to know about the responsibility you carry with your gifts? That's an important question. I've had to deal with people who had serious mental illnesses and I do not take it upon myself to say, I'm going to heal you, come every week. I would never do that. Um, and luckily, a psychic taught me when I was first beginning. He said, <laughs> you could predict, I see you going to a doctor. By the way, here's a number. I have um, referrals that I give. I also, I worked at the YWCA, which had domestic abuse counseling. And I give that out if they're in an abusive situation with a partner. I make sure they go. I mean, I can't force them, but I suggest. I give them the tools for serious issues. You know, they they can, look, I'm not going to see someone every week. So I, I do suggest you need that weekly. You could go to a therapist. Thank God we have medications or things you can do. Um, but take take this very seriously because I remember um, I was at one of the expos and there was a woman out there and we're all packing up and, and she was in a paranoid state with two little children. Oh, the neighbor's going to kill me. And it was obvious like she was in a paranoid state. And the other psychics were like, oh, we could heal you and blah, blah, blah. blah. And the first thing I said, do the children eat today? Um, where are you going to go on the bus? Does your husband know you're leaving on the bus? How do you know the neighbor's going to kill you? Um, so I calmed her down. I was the only one talking to her like that. Uh, I didn't think it was a place for a psychic to say, oh, I could heal you of the demons or whatever. I That's wrong. Get them to the doctor. Um, I'm very serious about that. And I have, luckily, because when I... Uh, I I do a lot of networking that I have these people I could refer them to. And I just started, I got it actually invited. Um, Dr. Amen, who is on PBS a lot with the brain scan. So I got invited to, well, I, they did a case study that we all could listen to. And then I got invited to a networking and I met with them. They gave me a tour. So I said, you know, I've been telling my clients uh, to look at your information, even for brain health, of how to eat healthy and, and what you can do. And, and um, so I would say, and I have a lot of cases and I've asked therapists, I have these shutdown boys by the time they're 18, mom, I'm not going to school and I'm not going to work. And the parents enable them. I said, that's serious. You, you, you have to see, you're going to have the kid 30 years old, which now they are who, who are not functioning. So um, I I am very strong with that. And I want people to realize there's a whole community 
that will collaborate with healing someone. You know, don't think you're God that, oh, I'm just going to give you Reiki and your mental illness is going away or your infection that's serious. So uh, be humble and um, reach out to a lot of professionals because, you know, there's serious things out there and you need to be responsible and not egotistical about saving and curing everybody. You, the only way you're going to do is get get the help they need. The integrity. Help them get, like, help them get the help they need. Yeah. The integrity of my dear friend, psychic medium, Joan Kara. Joan, one more time, please share with our listeners your website and where they can find out more about you. Joan Kara, C-A-R-R-A dot net, N-E-T. Psychic Joan at Yahoo, P-S-Y. C-H-I-C-J-O-A-N at yahoo.com, 203-531-6387. Joan, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing all of this amazing information. Oh, I can't thank you enough, Victor. And you had such insightful questions and what wisdom you shared with me. So I want to thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you, Joan. And thank you for joining us on Destination Unlimited. I'm Victor, the voice, Furman. Have a wonderful week.